All right. Hopefully this works. Uh, it froze up on me, so I'm starting over. Hi, Kate. How's Texas? Have they actually buttoned up in Texas, or are they just, like, thinking that they could shoot it? Shoot the virus? Has it affected, uh, the deliciousness of, uh, of Texas Hill Country briskets. God damn, I'm hungry. I'm eating these Pockies. We're having etouffee tonight. I think that's going to be tasty. Right now I'm just eating some Pockies, which are, I think, a delightful and very uh, convenient snack. Whoop. They're like little chocolate corn dogs. Said we're having etouffee, mon ami. Ah, bon me, eh? We're going to have a little bit bon tep roulé. Are you guys aware that the um, that the whole Cajun thing, like those people, the the the, the French uh, Louisianans, that they're there because of a massive act of ethnic cleansing after the French and Indian War. There was these group of like uh, people who were descended from the early French traders, to who had essentially intermingled with local Indian tribes, and created like a separate Creole ethnicity called uh, Acadians for the Acadian Mountains in the northern. Uh, by Quebec and in, uh, in Maine and over there, and after the uh, the British beat the French in the Seven Years' War, our French and Indian War, they said you guys are basically unassimilatable into this trade empire we're creating. Uh, you got to go, and so they were transported to the nearest still held French territory uh, in North America, which was French Louisiana. So there you go. I know this person saying I've heard of that. I I know not everyone has though. Not everyone knows the history of this country. Shit like that definitely doesn't get talked about too much. Population transfers tend to get under talked about. I have to say, victors of communism putting all COVID deaths on the, the communist towel, it's pretty good. It also puts all Wehrmacht deaths and um like auxiliary uh, militias that carried out the uh, Holocaust. They're all in the the, uh, the Black Book of Communism. Oh, right. I realized I could press this button and see these questions, so now I can look at these. Spill some tea, sis. Uh, whose tea should I be spilling? Silly. Y'all are silly. We just recorded an episode of the show with uh, Liz and Grace from True and On. It was really good. I'm very happy about it. Another reason I'm feeling better is I feel like we had a good show. There we go. Oh, we're getting them now. Ah, oh, god damn it. Walmart bad? Yeah. Okay. This is interesting. The question of U.S. balkanization. I've been thinking about this. Now, obviously, it's very facetious when, you, when Gavin Newsom talks about, like, you know, doing all this shit as a, as a, as a, as a uh, sovereign or whatever. It's all media bullshit. He's, he's, he's trying to raise himself in stature to a president so that he is a viable uh, candidate, either for VP or m maybe president next year or next time or president this time. There's a lot of fluidity in this situation, and he could really benefit from it. But the reality is, is that the degree to which this crisis leads to long-term, like, secular uh, 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 economic uh, crisis and shit, uh, that's worrying, to say the least. Uh, how do we maintain these 
I mean, we are already largely balkanized politically. How do uh, how do we like maintain these these social networks and this like nation system when with competing like agendas, competing cultures, uh, and with no sense? Like, if there's nobody in the middle to like pay the bills, like that's the real thing. If there's nobody at the center paying the bills and uh, and keeping the, the infrastructure intact, if we really do see a collapse of a of a supply chain. And I could see that, honestly, no joke, being, like, the best-case scenario. Like, the U.S. breaking up is probably preferable to it staying together under any kind of, like, hyper... It would have to be some sort of, uh, like, hyper-authoritarian construction. Uh, or, 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 But the thing is, a breakup could very easily just turn into, like, private... And more likely turn into, like, private corporate fiefdoms. Sort of like Snow Crash. It's not good, folks. Folks, we love it. We love it, don't we? I just said I just spilled the tea on uh, on authentic Neapolitan pizza and how I think it's bullshit, but it's not the worst type of pizza. Um, it's probably that St. Louis garbage. I like thin crust, but the fact that the cheese isn't really cheese to me is like a deal breaker. I would like actual cheese on my pizza. I mean, I'm a crookie. I mean, if you're gonna not have cheese on the pizza, have it something interesting like a tomato pie or New Haven style. Not this gross, like, string cheese processed shit. Get it out of here. Kindly foe. Kindly foe. There you guys go. I love tavern style. Honestly, I'm debating whether I want to make one later. I got one little skinny, one thin uh, frozen pizza. I have had Whataburger. Whataburger's pretty good. I like New Haven a lot. I like New Haven. I love Chicago Tavern style. Um, New York slices are good, but I'd say like inferior to both of those. And I like Detroit. If you want a thicker crust, Detroit is the way to go over like Sicilian, in my opinion. Are you guys ready to have a McKinsey algorithm determine that your life is uh, worth enough to risk going out in public in order to secure uh, like liquid assets of a certain percentage of uh, investment income in the fucking market over a, a, a coming quarter? Are you guys ready for that? I will say that the Beyond products are great. The Beyond Sausage is a phenomenal. Beyond Burgers are great. I have the Beyond uh, Ground Beef, and I'm going to use it for like a tomato sauce or something soon, and I'll see you then. Everyone's I've had is so good. And the Carl's Jr. Beyond um, Burger they had is really the best fast food uh, non-meat product I can think of. God damn it, I'm getting hungry. These pockets are not doing the job. So yeah, an algorithm is going to say whether or not like, because like I think the reason that they're really really brought they're really wait they're really considering this whole reopen thing is it's going to lead to a lot of deaths, but they're seeing who's dying, and it's people they can live without. Like they're seeing even in New York, like high 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 income areas, the infection rates aren't that high, even at the spike and all that. So they figure, well, we can 
you know, if we can get them to keep going out and spending and keeping the economy going, we can stay where we are. We'll be safe. The people who die will be first responders, uh, 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 fucking grocery, grocery people, um, bartenders, waiters, people who can always be replaced. Of course, it'll also affect people like doctors and nurses and professionals who have irreplaceable um, knowledge and skills that will undermine the ability of the actual state to, uh, to function. And that is, of course, the inevitable result of capitalism eating its own, uh, eating its fats until it's literally eating itself to death, eating the muscle, eating the, eating the organ, all to, uh, to sustain a profit margin that is no longer uh, rep- sustainable in, in this new system with this unprecedented demand drop. And with no, no slack in the line to recreate a new hegemony we, the way we did after World War II. So yeah, they're going to send us back and then we'll put us back after too many of us die and it gets too overwhelming. Go home for a few more months, then go back and the people who will die will be acceptable losses. Just, it'll be acceptable losses. Life insurance, that's interesting. Um, yeah, because they have, must be blowing their actuarial models right now out of hell. They're gonna if they survive in the future, they're probably gonna not cover. Um, they're not gonna cover COVID, co- coronavirus deaths the way that homeowners insurance doesn't cover floods or whatever. And this is the kind of thing you think would make people mad, you know? It kills me. They're right now talking in public about how many of you they're willing to sacrifice to the fucking cow god Moloch. They're fucking, they're, they're prophet god. They're, 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 they're making calculations on your life in front of you. And what are people willing to go out in the streets and protest about? So that they can stuff their fucking faces at fucking Fuddruckers. Uh, I can't go, I can't go waddle my fat ass to the old country buffet. This is tyranny. That is the freedom that they're fighting for. That's the only freedom that anyone is mobilized to defend in this fucking country. The freedom to stuff your fucking face. Hog people. I know you're not supposed to talk like this, but come on. It's there. Give me convenience or give me death. No, I'm, I'm, it's, it's less me disappointed in the people who don't fight because they are the scaredest and they're the most to lose, which is why it's hardest for them. The people who are doing this are doing it because they feel invincible, because they are that boomer cohort, covered in gold, protected by the golden sheen of the post-war American cargo cult. The last vestiges of that money are just draping them like gossamer, uh, gossamer cloaks. So they can go out there and stomp their feet for their fucking uh, awesome blossoms and fucking uh, unlimited steak fries at fucking, uh, what the fuck's it called? Ruby fucking Tuesdays? It's like you either have been pacified by, by the state, depending on like basically the accident of your birth. The, sta- the, the economy exists to discipline you or to indulge you. The per- the, 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 and the degree to which it is is the degree to which you are uh, invested within the system as opposed to a burden to the system. Like As a post-war consumer, you're a precious baby. We swaddle you. We indulge you. And so you, be- you become a giant baby. And you make- have tantrums about going back to the Fuddruckers. You have tantrum about guns. You're never going to take that gun. Insurance company charges you 20 grand after your fucking wife dies because of like a, uh, and, and, and you still have to pay that. You're not going to shoot anybody over that. That guy in fucking uh, Philadelphia who bought the Hanneman Hospital downtown to turn into condos and then um, they wanted to reopen it for COVID patients. And he said, yeah, for a million dollars. 
You're, you, you love your fucking guns and nobody shot that motherfucker? Fuck you. Allegedly, in the game parody. So the gun is just a big pacifier. Oh, I have my gun so I'm free. The fact that I have the gun means I'm free. No matter what degree of, um, of my life being totally constrained by the feckless decisions of the sons of sons of, of privileged dunderpates... Sorry, I went off there. I went off there a little bit. But that's because, of course, they're fine to have the guns. Of course you can give those people guns. They're not a threat. They love the system. They benefit from the system. You can give them all the guns they want. You can endose them. You can give them all the starches. and You can give them all the things they want. Because well, there's their, they're invested. But the people who aren't, the people who you need, the people who you need to be a reserved army of the unemployed, the people you need to do the grunt work that you're not willing or able to fucking motor, uh, automate yet, uh, the people you actually need, but the people whose interests are not served by the arrangement, the people who aren't benefiting, shit, you can't let them have anything other than fear and terror all their, every day of their lives. That's all you can ever fucking have. You can't give them any hope that anything can be different. So when a time like this happens, the people who are being literally fed into the maw of uh, the jaws of a, a mich- of a of a fucking cannibal monster... Uh, uh, have no ability to speak for themselves. A woman who died, a 27-year-old woman who had to go to work at a fucking grocery store where she wasn't provided... Uh, she, not only was she not provided a, a mask or gloves, they didn't even have fucking Purell. And she died at 27, and her last check was $20.67. It's, it's monstrous, but, like, who can look up long enough to even think about a way to to stand against it. Meanwhile, these motherfuckers are willing to go out there uh, in fucking Guy Fawkes masks and stamp their feet about how they can't go... uh, They can't go to Build-A-Bear. Because civil rights exist for them. Of course, as always, death to America. I'm sorry I went off on a rant there. One of my classic rants. I gotta say, after a moment like that, I realized, yeah, there's probably a reason that people say that. Classic rants, Krishman. That's me. You know what? Somebody suggested a song, and it is so perfect to the moment so perfect to the moment that I'm going to have to play it even if I get like that little exclamation point next to my story I don't think that I think that means you can still watch it so I'm not too worried about it besides I got off I already got off my good rants but this song is too much for the moment this is the song that everyone hears at every part of their mind and the reason that Obama never or Trump Bernie never had a chance really the song. Huh. Anybody have any suggestions for reading? Everybody knows the good guys lost. Fuck those old bitches. I think everybody who, re- who signed that thing at The Nation, which I haven't read and won't, all I need to know is that basically everybody in there has a fucking tenure. Everyone in there is a tenured professor somewhere. Someone there, every single person there has a fucking sinature and a prostate the size of a watermelon. And they can fucking jump up my asshole. Especially since, wh- who are they to talk? Like, they're saying, look, this failure proves you were wrong. Don't your entire life's record of nothing but failure do a better job? I mean, we have a longer record to look at, and you're just huge fucking losers. Good day, sir, you fucking self-important little toads. 
you guys succeeded because you, like everyone else in your generation, just grabbed that fat that was falling off the corpse of the post-war economy and just grabbed your little hunk of it, your little rotted hunk of, real, of cheap real estate and fucking GI uh, Bill parents with a fucking subdivision you could house that they bought for a nickel, scumbags. Only in the position you are in in, in, in in dinosaur legacy institutions that only haven't been dissolved by the like the ferocious uh, maw of, of private equity because they have some sort of sentimental uh, connection with this ri- this country's richest saps. Uh, I'm getting all riled. Does anyone want to hear me read anything? I actually have one. Actually, this is perfect. Uh, I was sug- I was resisting doing this because it's got a little bit of... Um, there's parts that could be clipped and used against me, I would say, basically. Like, somebody could very uh, epically make a, a, a joke, uh, like, Twitter meme out of it. But it's also perfect, especially since we were talking about the awful, indulgent, fucking boomer shithead... Uh, ex-radicals uh, who read the nation. Then the other fact, the fact that it's like an open letter to the new left in the nation, it's like it's not, it, you're literally directing it only to yourself. Only to self, only to other self-satisfied, smug, tenured fucks to all cost it yourself and your knowledge that you did the best thing at every point and you deserve your fucking marble countertops and your fucking th- $25,000 pizza stone and you deserve the house in the fucking country you deserve your kids having even though your kids are fucking dull eyed shitheads who you know don't deserve better than like a job in a fucking uh, um, like folding shirts in a gap or something they absolutely should uh, follow you into higher education and take your fucking spot because why because well, no you understand they have a learning disability So, uh, uh, this is from the Paddy Chayefsky. Uh, Paddy Chayefsky was a, a great screenwriter. He started in the 50s on the TV shows like Peyton Place and uh, Requiem for a Heavyweight. No, that was Rod Steiger. Anyway, or Rod Sterling. He, um, he, he wrote Network. He won an, an Oscar for Network. Uh, one of the greatest screenplays ever. A great movie. Incredibly prescient. Uh, and he uh, also made a movie about um, the medical field. He did he did he did media with uh, network and then he did a movie called The Hospital to star George C Scott as a hospital administrator where someone's like doing murders like patients are being killed and they don't know who it is and um, and he plays this beleaguered uh, and and it's all about just like the cynicism and failure of the medical thing about a, a field like how it's a business how it doesn't care about uh, health how it's like like soul crushingly bureaucratic uh, how it doesn't cure it only seeks to you know. Uh, it doesn't seek to cure, uh, and then he he at 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 one point uh, after you know towards the end of the movie, there's a big rant and he, and George C. Scott is like you know he's a classic Greatest Generation like Don Draper type he's like a Don Draper for hospital that's actually kind of a good comparison uh, uh, he is like the Don Draper of hospital administration uh, and he's got but like a little older so like Greatest Generation instead of uh, Korean War. Or World War Two instead of Korea. Anyway, and he has a, he has a young hippie son. It's called the hospital. George. All right, here it is. You're wasting your time. I've been impotent for years. What the hell is wrong with being impotent? Kids are more hung up on sex than the Victorians. I got a son, 23 years old. I threw him out of the house. Just ah, oh, box. I fucked that up. All right, let me try that again. All right, I'm going to start over. You're wasting your time. I've been impotent for years. What the hell is wrong with being impotent? Kids are more hung up on sex than the Victorians. I got a son, 23 years old. I threw him out of the house last year. Pietistic little humbug. 
He preached universal love, and he despised everyone. Had a blanket contempt for the middle class, even its decencies. He detested my mother because... My mother, because she had a petite bourgeois pride in her son, the doctor. I cannot tell you how brutishly he ignored that rather good lady. When she died, he didn't even come to the funeral. He felt the chapel service was a hypocrisy. He told me his generation didn't live with lies. I said, listen, everybody lives with lies. I grabbed him by the poncho and I dragged him the length of our seven-room, despicably affluent middle-class apartment, and I flung him out. I haven't seen him since. You know what he said to me? He's standing there on the landing, you know, on the verge of tears. He shrieked at me, you old fink, you can't even get it up anymore. That was it, you see. That was his real revolution. It wasn't racism, the oppressed poor, or the war in Vietnam. No, the ultimate American social sickness was a limp dingus. My God, if there is a more despised, misunderstood minority in this country, it is our poor, impotent bastards. Well, I'm in impotent, and I'm proud of it. I don't mean merely limp. Disagreeable as it may seem to a woman, a man may lust for other things. Something a little less transient than an erection. A sense of permanent worth. That's what medicine was to me. My reason for being. You know, Miss Drummond, when I was 34, I presented a paper before the annual convention of the Society of Clinical Investigation that pioneered a whole goddamn field of immunology. A breakthrough. I'm in all the textbooks. I happen to be an eminent man, Miss Drummond. You know something else, Miss Drummond? I don't give a goddamn. When I say impotent, I mean I've lost even my desire to work. That's a hell of a lot. That's a hell of a lot more of primal passion than sex. I've lost my reason for being, my purpose. The only thing I've ever truly loved. Well, it's all rubbish, isn't it? I mean, transplants, antibodies. We manufacture genes. We can produce birth... In, we could birth, we could produce birth echo genetically. We could practically clone people like carrots, and half the kids in the ghetto haven't even been inoculated for polio. We have established the most enormous medical entity ever conceived, and people are sicker than ever. We have cured nothing. We heal nothing. The whole goddamn wretched world is strangulating in front of our eyes. That's what I mean when I say impotent. There we go. Oh, George C. Scott. Uh, mad props to George C. Scott. He was a guy who always said he hated the Oscars. He wouldn't go to the Oscars. He, he didn't care about the Oscars. He didn't think actors should do that. He thought it was a craft. He thought it was an art. And he didn't like them being brought out like show ponies to be, like, judged on the ha on the hoof. And so when he got the Oscar for uh, Patton, he not only didn't show up, he rejected it. He said, don't give it to me. I don't want it. <laughs> Respect. It was a goddamn meat market. Man, he ruled. Come on, look, George C. Scott, Buck Turgidson, fucking Dr. Strangelove. Phenomenal. One of the great characters in Kubrick. I'm, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair must. Uh, take it to 8 million, uh, depending on the breaks. Phenomenal. Uh, also, of course, yes, uh, 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 the hospital he's great in, uh, fucking, uh, hardcore, turn it off, turn it off, Patton, uh, that, where he played Patton as a psychopath, and he became, like, worshipped by, like, uh, like, reactionaries, that's so perfect, that, like, Coppola and Scott saw Patton as, like, a maniac, and the whole movie was about how he was insane, and guys like Nixon loved it, Nixon used to watch it over and over again on the presidential yacht to, like, fire himself up to bomb the North Vietnamese, because like you're like you're representing this insanity and if somebody shares that insanity it's like looking through a keyhole it's like oh my god this movie is, speaks directly to me that's how you know it's a good movie honestly because it really does it's like actually exploring something it's not just like sterilely replicating it R.I.P. to Brian Dennehy a, a legend and a pimp he was good you know it was a good movie he's in underrated movie uh bestseller him and james woods he plays like a joseph wamba ex-cop uh who writes fiction about uh, like uh fictionalized like journalism about like cops and james woods approaches him he's an assassin and he a hitman and he wants to write his biography and then they go do crimes together r.i.p to the real one brian dennehy bestseller also fx with him and brian uh brian brown that australian guy 
which is really fun because he plays a cop and he teams up with a special effects guy, a guy who does like movie special effects to like stop a drug dealer. It was always a drug dealer. In the 80s, it was always a drug dealer. Uh, it's really funny and it's got a lot of wacky ga- gags and stunts. Uh, yeah, FX, also fun. So you guys, I've uh, I'm started to read by uh, the big book, uh, Campaign of the Century, about uh, Upton Sinclair uh, and the 1934 uh, race. I gotta say, I'm very excited. The book is great. Uh, it's actually a really I've never I've heard of it before. Uh, it's a really well well done piece of uh, of popular fiction. I believe it won a number of uh, of like awards. Anyway, it's like a, a day by day chronicling of the whole. Uh, campaign and man, like just the stuff that you could remember just reading reading back through about about that election is nuts. Uh, they really pulled out all the stops to kill that guy to fucking stop that guy. They really thought that he might like bring communism to America. And the funny thing is, is that he was a total fruitcake. <laughs> Upton Sinclair was not Bernie Sanders. Upton Sinclair was Marianne Williamson. On God, he was a Puritan, uh, like classic nineteenth century like crank. He was like a he was like a sexually repressed wasp, who believed in like uh, like fad dieting and uh, speaking to the dead with like radios. He wrote a book about uh, talking to the dead, and he almost fucking he brought this movement that they had to bring out all the stops to stop him. It's like it's a very fun story, and it's got a lot of resonances with the with this campaign. Uh, but it's so funny because like Upton Sinclair is basically. The man posted cringe, nonstop. And like the question of Upton Sinclair is, how do you weigh good intentions and honestly very successful attempts at political organizing against all that goddamn cringe? Yes, the the muckraker. He ran for governor of California, four three times, twice as a socialist, but then he almost won as a Democrat in 1934. Oh, is Richard Hoagland? Is he the natural law party guy? I love the natural law party. I have seen debates with like their natural law party, and I'm like, what does that mean? And they're like, well, we uh, think that the basis for human law should be a uh, uh, natural law. And I just has anyone know what that means? I've never really found it out. It just seems like sort of a, a magnet for stray cranks who can't fit into any other of the crank party mold. I don't know, like leftover crank, like crank trimmings. Like what they make McNuggets and McRib out of. That's where you get uh, the fucking natural law party guys. I don't know. I am started a book about... I have the book on my computer. The uh, book about the Carnation Revolution. I'll, I'll be reading it shortly. I hope after I do this thing with the Upton Sinclair. But yeah, I want to I I talk about the Carnation Revolution. Because like, like I was saying, the military, that's more than... It, it's, it's a... Ooh, it's an X factor, to, to put it at least in this flowing, quickly flowing situation. Did you, did you, you have any idea what natural pole law party meant? Did you know what that meant, or was it just funny? Marianne Williamson coasted cringe. Come on. It was adorable, but it was definitely cringe. I remember when she said that the, this was the time when America was going to slam it and slam it hard. But all of Hollywood conspired to defeat Upton Sinclair. All the studio heads were mega reactionaries. 
and they wanted to make sure that uh, their precious uh, monopoly didn't get fucked with because Sinclair actually proposed using public funds to create public studios, like public art, that would compete directly with the studio films. Basically declared war on the movie Colony, and they fought back. And you really see where hegemony comes in handy. Oh no, he farted in public. De Crancio! John Hagelin! I knew it was, that's, I knew I was close. John Hagelin. I remember seeing him in a debate when I was a kid on a C-SPAN or something, and I just never knew what the fuck natural law party means. If anyone knows, shoot me a line. I think they're anti-abortion. I don't know. Yeah, because it sounds like nat- like the Nazis. Because like you could describe if you like because not like fascism is notoriously uh, fluid ideologically. Uh, uh, it's like postmodern in that way. But um, but if you had to like find an animating thing in in Nazism. Oh man. I forgot what I was saying. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you can find, like, any kind of, like, justifying ideology, philosophically, like, base, it's the idea that, like, it's the idea that stri- might versus right, that's basically where it all springs from. Like, it's all, life is competition between uh, groups. The most, the, the, the worthiest group will win. Or uh, uh, That is what must happen because of the natural order. And that, like, the race and all that stuff is all just an expression, a social expression of that underlying reality. So that does sound like the natural, like natural law party would be a good another name for the for the Nazis. So, but what the hell are they actually like? I don't know. They did not. And the Jewish studio heads had no solidarity with European Jewry at all. Really grotesque stuff. Those are some of the worst guys. Those studio heads were real scumbags. Are there any contemporary fascist leaders? Okay, that's interesting. All right, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. I would say, in a meaningful sense, not in the United States. Uh, I would say the closest you're going to talk. Uh, the closest I would say, and there's still argument. I can't even say definitively. I would say you could put them on the table to like look at further, and I honestly don't know because I feel like it's such a fluid concept. And it's like applicability to the moment is to me very fluid. I don't, I don't know. And things are changing so fast that like the conditions that created fascism might arrive again. But, but, but without the precondition of mass politics, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's what you would even call fascism. So it's very hard for me to get specific. So what I would say is in the basket of those guys, you would have a guy like Modi, Bolsonaro, and uh, Orban. I don't think Trump's in that basket necessarily. I think maybe he is leaning in that basket range. He's like, if they're in like one basket for discussion, he's in the next most, like in a Bayesian thing. Like he's in the second most likely situation. But that's it. And then beyond that, I don't know. I I, I can't say. I was talking, I had a little rant earlier. You might want, I'll, when this is over, you should watch it. I had a little rant about those Michigan protesters and their privilege of the last lives and how pathetic they are and how they're, they show that the, the idea of like freedom, because like, 
there's human freedom, right? The human freedom promised by communism. The human freedom promised by um, transcending um, scarcity, right? Uh, the, the end state of cap communism, right? There's that. If you can't have that, what you can have is uh, material comforts, consumption choices, like a, a, a sublimated desire for, for human autonomy that's expressed through consumption. And so those are, and so with those as the options, um, God damn it. What all you get from uh, from America, all you get from American freedom is that second thing. You don't get the real freedom. You don't get real freedom. And I'm not saying that something like North Korea is real freedom. I'm saying that it's worth striving towards that instead of forswearing it for, for something that at the end leaves you bitter and, uh, and empty and then eventually destroys itself. That's the worst part. It's not even sustainable. It's all going to eat itself. We're eating this, the, like the system is eating its flesh. It's eating its, its, its reserve fat. It's eating its organs. It's going to eat its bones. It's just hollowing out like it can't respond to this happening because everything's been sold off. Everything's been auctioned off. I keep entering the rant zone. I'm sorry. And nobody knows what to do because these guys never had to be asked to do anything before. Like, they have to just, just seriously consider the reality of the state reclaiming sovereignty from capital in the face of a crisis. That's what the actual job right now of a political figure should be. The Herculeanness of chat, of mess, of the massiveness of that undertaking is so beyond the capacity of people who were never, this must be stressed, never asked to do any real choices. No executive, no governor, no prime minister, no president in this country, in this world, has to actually make real decisions. The, the real guiding decisions are made by bond traders, by the Federal Reserve, by stocks, by, uh, by the market in all of its expressions. Uh, your job is to manage the outcome of those market relationships. And that's easy. It's just basically what line of bullshit do you feed people to ma uh, mask the mechanical nature of these decisions. Now they have to make a real choice. Human lives or keeping the economy strong in the short term, preventing a drop in stocks or something. One of them would require... Like the reason they're they're still one of the big reasons they're forfeiting authority to the to the to the market isn't just that they're bought for not just that they're bought, it's that they don't want the authority because they don't know how to do it because they were never asked to make these decisions and they want to forfeit it they want to give the gun away they were like no go give it to me because they can't handle it because they were never asked to do that that was never the job and now having them do this they're just. They will sacrifice all of us so that they don't have to intervene. Because we could intervene. We could, but it would break the compact. It would destroy, it would break the spell, essentially, of capitalism. And they can't let that happen because they don't know if they'll ever be able to reverse it. It is an existential threat. And like I said, even if it causes huge breakdowns of society and you end up with like little militarized fiefdoms and like disconnected states, but you maintain hierarchies within them, then like the fucking architect said in the Matrix, there are levels of survival we're willing to accept. It's not ideal, but they'll take it over giving over power. <sighs> Very depressing. I've been on rant mode big time, guys. I've been ranting up. This is good. This is a good one. I feel like some of these have been pretty good rants. I might pump, I might pit my rant. I might actually go on Twitter and say, "Hey, check out my rants. They're pretty epic today."
we're going to get all the death. We're going to get all the death associated with just letting this go when we reopen haphazardly and then have to close again and all that. All those people die who didn't have to if we just manage the economy in a, in a stopgap way until instead of needing to pump the back, thing back up. Shit, I forgot. Man, it is really slim thinking in world leaders. Everyone really sucks, man. Just think of the awful buffoons in charge. Like these like bloodless bureaucrats or absolute clowns. Literally Bolsonaro, Trump, these are clowns. And not even in the sense of like wise clowns, like like leer clowns, like buffoons, like empty caricatures that just floated to the top of just an absolutely uh, a moribund political process. Like, when all the power and authority of, uh, uh, seeped out of government, it became a hollow show. And, of course, these most entertaining puffins just popped to the top of it because uh, it's what it values. It's what, it's what it shows. Hey. Huh. And then who, who's the good guys? Who's the good guys? Angela fucking Merkel? Woman who bathes in Greek blood every night. And you got like fucking guys. I'm sorry, but like Putin, no, thank you. I don't think that guy's got anybody's best interests at heart. Fucking Erdogan. Fucking Benjamin Netanyahu, wildly criminal, crooked motherfucker. Fucking getting reelected over and over again, under indictment and getting indicted. Running into this absurd, crooked, fucking settler colonial hell state. I'm sorry, the Chinese, I, I'm not, it's like, they really haven't seemed to care about ideology or moving left or, like, liberating people. They seem really more about making that, making that fucking shatter. I mean, the record seems pretty clear. Unless they're doing some sort of elaborate rope-a-dope where they're going to, like, wait until we've, like, lowered our guard because we, they out, like, capitalism us, and then they, like, spring into action and say, aha, we were actually going to do communism the whole time. It looks more like they're doing what everybody's doing, which is trying to grab the resources that are left while we can. That's why they're in Africa. That's why they're pushing out around their territorial waters to get natural gas, to get uh, to get trade routes, fucking Belt and Road. Same reason Russia's doing what they're doing in the Middle East or in Ukraine to maintain these areas where they can have enough when these global supply chains break down. It's just a scramble by the top 1% in every country to use the... It's basically, you know what it is? The global bourgeois, right? Imagine them up here. Or the global... Like, not bourgeois, the global like ruling class. Every other, Every society, every social formation. They're up here. They know the thing's falling apart. There's a big pile of money, the big pile of resources, the big pile of remaining uh, like commodities that can like power a society with us with uh, and generate um, generate surpluses because if it doesn't generate surpluses, then you're back to fucking the Stone Ages, and you're back to equality. Honestly, you're back to social equality. Also, uh, instead, you need you need to maintain a, a, a hierarchy. You need to maintain inequality, uh, and you need to maintain surpluses. So that means. You need those resources. So they're getting those resources to like build on. And then the thing between them is like state structures, like countries, like corporations, but then through corporations, nation states. And formations like NATO or whatever the fuck. And then those fucking arms coming down are grabbing the shit, pulling it off the table like hungry, hungry hippos. That's what we're in. That's what this, that's the global situation we're looking at right now. It's grim. It's a grim situation. But it's like every country, every country you look at what they're doing, you try to examine what like the what what frame makes sense for these decisions. The answer is always preserving and expanding access to resources. Surpluses if you want to make it just as blunt as possible. Just abstract it as possible. Just so you think of it in purely economic terms. 
That is it. Ideology has nothing to do with it. And, and if con some countries aren't able to stand up for themselves, and they just become subsidiaries. They become another pastor thing. They become a, a, a colony, a subtle colony. And then you have local comprador elites who get to join in with the other ones. They get kind of picked out, like, not, not as a whole social class, but like as individuals within a social order. Like the, like the new rich in Angola. Like that, the world's first youngest woman billionaire, the, the, the daughter of the former dictator of Angola. Because she's got a jillion dollars in oil wealth that doesn't trickle down in any way to the actual citizens there. Like Nigeria, which has tons of oil and has also seen uh, Dutch Shell hire mercenary armies to shoot protesters who are trying to resist their fucking habitats being poisoned by fucking extraction mechanisms. Ah, oh, it sucks. It sucks. Boy. That's the real. That's the real shit. We just dropped some real shit tonight. I like that. I feel unburdened. Uh, unpacking the real. The real. And the thing is, some social orders, though, have a better claim. Like, I'm rooting for Cuba. I'm rooting for Cuba. I'm rooting for uh, Maduro's Venezuela. I'm I'm rooting for Nicaragua to get their share in the scramble because I know it's going to be used somewhat more equitably and justly than the other stuff that's going to get looted. So yeah, I have countries I root for, but it doesn't change the fact that like this is not an ideological struggle, and ideology will not be uh, uh, what determines the outcome. Uh, that was a little half-hearted. I think. Uh, I think that's. I think people's enthusiasm for the hollow gesture there is uh, is uh, waning. Uh, my my the word. Uh, someone asked me about AMLO, and I have to say the only thing I have to say about AMLO is to quote uh, the old the old wily dictator of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz. Pity Mexico. So far from God, so close to the United States. Uh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, those, those, all those like friendly, like, like. Because uh, there's these people who want to claim that the Chinese intervention, in, uh, economic uh, development in in Africa is some sort of goodwill gesture, or like, or or, or uh, ironically, they act like it's like the Peace Corps or something. Uh, and in reality, it's like an attempt by China to essentially buy their way into critical infrastructure areas in an incredibly uh, resource-rich region. It's going to be more and more a place where exploitation is going to happen. I mean, fucking, there's a lot of unexplored oil and shit in Africa. And, because they haven't had the infrastructure to exploit it, and you know, it's 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 a real shit. And now, of course, they're feeling, hey, we're, you're ripping us off, and, and the resistance is kicking in. I don't know who's gonna win. The Chinese certainly look like they have the upper hand. If they bottled up coronavirus the way they claim to have, or honestly, it doesn't matter. I'm thinking, either they bottled it up that well, or they have such a control over their fucking uh, like information streams outside and inside the country that it doesn't effectively matter if they have because people don't know except for in the very specific regions affected they're pretty impressively uh, ready to expand the only question is can they handle the massive drop in export demand that's going to that's happening now because they're still an export based economy uh, that's the real that's the real question I'm certainly rooting for uh, Evo Morales and Ebeas Mas Mas Viva Mas Viva Mas uh. 
I'll confess though. Ah, never mind. <sighs> Virgil is as real as he is in your hearts. Virgil will exist if you believe in him. If you believe in Virgil, clap your hands. If you believe in Virgil, clap your hands. Lazaro Cardenas was pretty good. He, Cardenas is good. I have a soft spot for Cardenas. I mean, I really like Zapata a lot. I fucking love Pancho Villa. Uh, uh, fucking Carenza. I hate that motherfucker. Vestudianzo Carenza. <coughs> Carenza. Ugh. The fact that he got shot in his ass. Good. Good riddance. Ugh. Hate Carenza. And Maduro is such a perfect lib. Maduro is the perfect fucking lib. Like, accommodating to the right and, and uh, cutting off all connections to the popular base so that they can turn on you and destroy you. It's like textbook, and they keep doing it every time. Oh, thank you. You're the man. I did a couple of years on a uh, on a on an unfinished uh, M A in American history post war. That's my specialty. I never finished my final because I had I, I knew I wasn't going to do anything with a degree because I knew I wasn't going to go to, like go to get a PhD. So I was like, do I really want to? I kind of like a sunk cost thing of like, do I want to go through the pain of writing this whole thing that I'm never going to use for anything for a degree that's not going to help me do anything. Uh, if then, so yeah, I just, I just did sunk costs. I only even, I did the first year and I hated it. And I only did the second year because I was accepted to do, uh, I was accepted as a, um, as a TA. So I got, instead of having to pay, I got, instead of having to pay, I got, uh, got paid. So it made sense as a job just to do it. So I TA'd for a year, but then I never really finished. I never wrote my final paper. <laughs> Because it was like, what this? I'm not going to use it. So I'm a lazy shithead. That's the thing about me. No one should ever listen to anything I have to say. I'm a big fat tub of failure. Uh, I am a. Uh, I'm a large. Uh, I'm a large. I'm a mondo tool. All right, guys. Looks like we're counting down. Well, this is a fun one. I'm having a good time. We'll see if this lasts or if it's back. Down in the bay of fucking bay of the abyss. We'll see. I do listen to that, all right. All right, guys. Peace in the chicken grease in the Middle East. Keep it real. Keep it sleazy.